I'm going to dive deeper into uh, our given rights, our constitutional rights, as well as any rights that have ever been uh, described in, in any official documents or, or other, um, and uh, really understanding what rights we have as citizens within a democracy and how we can best exercise those rights. So thanks for joining today. I hope it will be a productive conversation for you. Uh, if you're on Instagram, you can obviously see uh, I'm very, very much into the right of voting. <laughs> uh, so far in my constitution uh, study group um, exercises that I've been doing this for, oh man, I've been doing this for three months now. Uh, really finding out that um, voting is is our our main right within a democracy. Uh, there are other rights written in the Bill of Rights, and I'll go over those today. But we'll we'll see that actually those rights that are are written there are actually uh, quite limited and not really pertaining to the rights of us as citizens on a day to day basis. Of course, voting is a right that we only exercise for a short, you know, what is this, just a few minutes every every year, a couple times a year, uh, we get to uh, exercise that right. Uh, but it means a lot. It means so much more. So much more than you may, you may think. Well, I'm just uh, sharing a little bit here. I'm going to get a little bit off the Constitution today just because in my research of trying to find places where rights are addressed in the Constitution uh, within the Bill of Rights and even outside of the Bill of Rights, uh, I found some, uh, some other terminology uh, that I'm going to actually spend a bit more time uh, covering today. I hope everybody is having a great week so far. I am. The weather here in Vegas has been pretty spectacular. It's still pretty warm, but at night it's been cooling off. Not looking forward to when the cold is actually here, but uh, we'll survive. We'll make it through. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, I'm going to start by looking at the uh, Bill of Rights. That's the first step. Um, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and read the, the preamble here. It says, the conventions of a number of the states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a, a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers that further de declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added. And as extending the ground of public confidence in the government, will best ensure the benefit, beneficent ends of its institution. Resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America, in Congress assembled two-thirds of both houses concurring that the following articles be proposed to the legislatures of the several states as amendments to the Constitution of the United States. All or any of which articles, when ratified by three-fourths of the said legislatures to be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the said consti Constitution. Articles in addition to an amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America proposed by Congress and ratified by the legislatures of the several states pursuant to the fifth article of the original Constitution. All right, so that's just the, the logistics of how uh, these amendments were passed uh, and included here. Uh, so the Bill of Rights uh, was the original first 10 amendments uh, that were included at the, uh, the adoption of the Constitution. Of course, uh, we have continued to go on to amend it 17 more times, and uh, we haven't had an amendment in a very long time. I think 1992 is the last amendment uh, that we had added to the Constitution. So um, kind of interesting that we're at a time where we should be revisiting that, and maybe we will soon. All right, so Amendment 1 says Congress shall make no law respecting 
an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So freedom of speech, freedom to say what we want, think what we want, practice what we want. That's a pretty simple right. Um, it is right. You know, so when I say that uh, voting is the only right that we have, um, maybe that's that's not correct. Yeah, we do have these underlying rights to uh, practice what we want and, and think what we want and say what we want. Uh, that right, just like with the right of voting, it is possible to corrupt that right, as we see um, happening with voter suppression or uh, with, um, you know, trying to quiet down uh, protests or, or things that people are trying to express about themselves. Uh, but I think within this right also includes your right to speak to your representatives, to share your ideas um, with your representatives about what you want what you want. Okay, so Kayla says, have you heard uh, JP Sears comments on IG regarding free speech? I haven't, but I'm gonna look it up right now. Is it on his uh, his Instagram? JP Sears is, is funny. Um, a couple of his videos lately I've been, I don't, I don't know if he's being overly sarcastic because, uh, yeah, he is touching on some very important topics, topics that I've gone over in this series, um, and I just don't know. Awaken with JP. Yeah, that's his handle. Let's see. Howdy, blind three. Howdy, howdy. Yes, okay. Is it, like, on one of his later posts? I don't know, Kayla, you're going to have to, he has a lot going on here on his, uh, let's see, what do you say? Awaken with JP. I know that guy. Yeah. We all know that guy. He's pretty, he has gotten more aggressive. Uh, and I don't know if he's being more aggressive to be facetious, to like, uh, you know, kind of make commentary of what's going on within Oh, interesting. So he's spreading misinformation about COVID and lots of followers are calling him out on it. Now he's being censored by IG and very vocal about it. Let me look up an article on that. Thanks for giving me that context. So now I will find that. Well, that's the thing. So where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line of um, challenging somebody's rights it's the same thing with uh, with the, um, the face mask argument of people saying, we have the right to do what we want, I have the right to not wear a mask. But in the situation where it involves public safety, your rights kind of go out the window. Um, and so maybe his right of uh, freedom of speech uh, is being challenged now because he is... Uh, Propagating misinformation that is challenging public health and public safety. So that could be it. Fighting censorship. Oh, so he made a video called Fighting Censorship, and this was posted five weeks ago. Yeah, so he's uh, he's standing up against the social media giants that are censoring speech. Censored but not silenced. That's his hashtag on that. Yeah, I mean, and what responsibility do the social media... I mean, gosh, man. You start a company thinking that you're, like, keeping people connected and uh, making some money, helping advertisers connect with, with their customers, uh, and then you end up becoming... Uh, a political a political machine like this involved in censorship should we have free speech if that speech is inaccurate if that that speech is detrimental to public health 
But yeah, that's what I had noticed. I usually like his videos a lot. I think they're really funny um, and clever. But lately I've seen, oh, you give me a link. Great. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, lately, I've, the past few videos I've watched have, have really been kind of like on that whole like conspirituality angle uh, that I spoke on a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he's, he's an influencer. People, people listen to him. I believe what he says because he's funny. You know, it's important to be funny. Let's see your link you gave. Uh, thank you for protecting me from free speech Instagram. I'm definitely not smart enough to be considered. Oh, sorry. Let me move this in here so you guys can see it with me. Um, maybe I'll just do this so you can see it better. Thank you for protecting me from free speech Instagram. I'm definitely not smart enough to consider information and think for myself because I'm dumb. Thank you for treating me accordingly as you do my thinking for me. My only hope is that you can silence more people and their ideas. Oh, good grammar, JP. A world without the exchange of ideas is a dictatorship, and you, Instagram, are helping to make this dream into a reality. You're doing God's work. Thank you for protecting me from three-year censorship. Wow, that's sarcasm if I ever saw it. <laughs> and then here's his post. This is a post you commented on contained false information. Interesting. Oh, good. Correct his grammar. Let's see what the responses were. I always like seeing responses, people, on the comments. <laughs> Uh, grammar police, yeah. Censor his grammar, his bad grammar. <laughs> yeah, at first when I saw him sharing disinformation, I thought it was like sarcasm. I thought he was doing that on purpose, like the rest of his, his humor and comedy. But, you know, when you're dealing with this and... And then conspiracy theories that really do exist and really are confusing people and causing uh, a lot of issues. Yeah, it's dangerous. So, And then your response to it is even more sarcasm. Yeah, I don't think uh, people respond well to that. So, so are we, are we uh, having a cancel culture on JP Sears now? I've been talking a lot about cancel culture. So in my Monday live stream, Dignified Hospitality, I had on a guest... Hi, good to see you. I had on a guest that spoke to me about some injustices. Uh, and actually, he didn't specifically talk about the injustices or specifically call anybody out. And I, I asked him not to do that. I said, hey, the purpose of these conversations is... Uh, <laughs> uh, the purpose of doing these conversations is to get the, the dialogue going and to get people... Um, you know, talking and thinking about culture and thinking about ways that we can take our own accountability and responsibility of, of making those improvements we want to see. And so, yeah, I don't want people bad mouthing and, and cancel culturing individuals. Let's cancel culture entire cultural movements or entire uh, cultural characteristics, such as the conspiracies uh, surrounding this virus. Um, that has affected us so badly. Cultural mishaps. It's a good way to put it, Faith. Um, you're doing God's work. Yeah. That Saying something like that usually shouldn't come with sarcasm. Like, that's a pretty powerful statement to make. So, yeah, if you're saying something like that with sarcasm, no, no good. By the way, today I am drinking a beautiful yellow tea from South India from the Tinier family. Um... I feel very privileged and lucky to be drinking this tea right now. It's going to mellow me out. It's going to mellow me out and root me in uh, so as we take on these discussions. Because I'm going to talk about some big stuff today. I know, like, yeah, Kayla, you just, like, you just, like, brought it in with the JP series. That's, it's incredible. And I didn't know, and I'm glad to see that. Because that, like, totally clears up a whole lot of confusion that I had around his personality, um, in regards to the past few videos that I've watched him speak on. I'm like, is he really being that sarcastic that he's actually pretending to be one of these conspirituality? Is that a conspiritual? Uh, well, uh, spiritualist. That's not a word. Uh, prone to conspiracy in the new age. <laughs> That's funny. 
Uh, Kayla says, I haven't yet canceled JP. I'm reading a lot lately and seeing what his followers are saying. I agree with you on the issue of adding sarcasm on sarcasm. It's a lot. Oh, and you've shared another article. Thank you so much. Oh, everybody's sharing stuff with me. Awesome. I'm going to check it all out and I will share it with everybody. The problem with JP. Uh, okay, cool. So a criticism. criticisms. Are oh, thank you so much, Faith. Uh, I'm going to play this in the background of the rest of our Constitution Study Group. I think that's nice. Thank you for sharing that. It's from three years ago. Interesting. The article says, you might know J.P. Sears from his popular ultra-spiritual life videos in which he presents a parody of faddish new age spiritual beliefs and healthy eating life coach gurus. See, for example, his viral send-up of self-righteous vegans. Sears' videos are often funny and witty and have proved popular with skeptics and rationalists because they effectively lampoon various fad diets and new age spirituality, highlighting the hypocrisy and logical leaps made by supporters. This has led many to assume that he's a comedian with a critical thinking of skeptical bent. Unfortunately, this seems to be an unwarranted assumption. The first warning flag is that Sears not only lampoons New Age spirituality and self-help, he is also a genuine life coach from a launch of premium subscription service. So yes, he is a life coach, so he's not just uh, a comic. His website describes him as an emotional healing coach who offers one-on-one -on -one sessions and organizes retreats to empower people to live more meaningful lives. It also explains that he holds certification as a holistic coach, advanced pr practitioner through the Holistic Coaching Institute of Columbus. Yada, yada, yada. It would be unfair to damn Sears for his association, despite his glowing endorsements of Macmillan as a powerful mentor who changed his life. Uh, but maybe, but probably not. Sears' qualifications and chosen career are warning flags, but it is an actual content of his videos that set off the loudest pseudoscientist klaxons. He might be best known for his satirical parodies of egotistical New Agers, but if you look a bit deeper into his content, you start to see elements of the anti-science sentiment and fondness for conspiracy theories prevalent throughout the holistic. Wow, and this was written three years ago. Incredible. I need to share this uh, with, uh... you know, it's so funny because yeah, I always read into him thinking that it was purely sarcasm, that he was purely just making fun of these things. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, he may have been using sarcasm as a guise uh, to get away with sharing these thoughts and ideas. Yeah, this is a big problem. I talked with a friend yesterday, a musician friend, and he had his own <laughs> grief with, um, like, spiritual musicians who uh, have been playing to a certain tuning, uh, thinking that there's some, you know, heightened spiritual experience by by playing music in this tuning and that it's been proven over and over again that there's not. Um, this is kind of funny how like this misinformation guised as enlightenment or as wokeness is actually um, detrimental. Thanks for sharing that, Kayla. I appreciate uh, you sharing that article with me. I'm definitely going to pass this along. Yeah, because there are some folks that I work with uh, that kind of idealize uh, the the sarcasm and the communication techniques of, of J.P. Sears. They call it broisms. So it's like, it could be harmful. You know, you think you're smart. You think that you're outsmarting the listener uh, by using sarcasm or using, I don't know, any uh, other types of communication tools to, to outsmart the listener and make, maybe use reverse psychology to get the listener to, to understand your perspective. So yeah, broisms is like, it's like a sarcastic way of like enlighten. But it's so funny because the, the guys that like came up with this broism, it's like a very um, kind of encrypted language uh, the, uh, the the people that came up with that language are all bros. They're all dudes. There's like no gender diversity in their, their community of people. And they're like, oh, but, you know, it's intentionally designed to be unclear and um, hard to understand at first. And it's kind of a filter uh, to allow an exclusive group of people that will understand that sarcasm. Well, who's that going to be that's going to be all the bros? I understand that. 
of lying. So you say, I've read that sarcasm is a person, uh, and a person comes from a root of pain inside the person using it. Very, it's very true. You know, sarcasm is not always that. Uh, you know, sarcasm can be a, a broad range of meaning, not not directly like, oh, I'm lying about this thing right now to, um, to make a joke, uh, to make you... You, if you're smart enough, you'll all obviously know that I'm lying about this thing. But it can be deeper than that too. Um, an, an example uh, that uh, I remember recently: uh, a uh, circus performer, a friend of mine, went to go see a circus show on the Strip. Obviously, that show is not active right now, but uh, because of the uh, the pandemic, but. Uh, their criticism of the show was that the show was actually very dangerous uh, and very racist. And it's like, yeah, but the, show, the, the creators of the show, the writers of the show are actually very progressive and diverse. They're like J.P. Sears using like stereotypical racist jokes to poke fun and, uh, you know, a smart audience member will see that and will laugh at how ridiculous racism actually is. But the problem that my friend had noticed was that the audience around her were all like middle American white people, that tourists on the strip that, you know, wanted to go see this popular show. And from their perspective, they are not reading that sarcasm. And instead, uh, they're, they're laughing. They're given permission to laugh at these jokes. Uh, their racism was enabled through that sarcasm. So we have to be really careful, you know, about how we communicate. And that's why, like, when it comes to important issues such as civic engagement, democracy, quality, you know, I don't know if there's a big place for sarcasm in those conversations. You know, maybe if, if we have confidence that the listener of our sarcasm understands sarcasm, then it can be okay, it can be effective, it can be fun, it can make communication more fun. But, you know, if you're doing like a mass communication to a big group of people, it's really hard to know if people are going to understand your language, if they're going to understand what your intention and meaning is through your free speech. So yeah, good topic. Good sarcasm, I believe a good sarcasm requires a lot of intelligence, which JP Sears really has, but it also lacks harm. There can be a fine line, good sarcasm lacks harm. Yeah. In the most important topics, directness is best. Yes, it is. And it's so funny because like our, our president, he always, not always, but I feel like several times when he's been called out for saying things that were disrespectful or not appropriate, um, utilizes uh, the sarcasm excuse. It's like, oh, I didn't really mean that. And it's like, you are the leader of the most uh, powerful organization in the world, um, making very influential decisions about not only our policies internationally and domestically, but also representing us as a culture. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of room for sarcasm there. And if you are going to be sarcasm, be very, very smart about it. <laughs> It's almost like you, you can use a sarcasm, but then immediately afterwards you have to use direct communication to explain your perspective. Um, so yeah, freedom of speech, freedom of sarcasm, it's true. Uh, but we also have another right to protect, um, I'll get into that later, but we have, we have another right and duty to protect the safety and well-being of our community and of others and, and, and public health. So if our freedom of speech is doing harm to that, um, or our speech in general, not our freedom to, of course we have the freedom to, but if, if we're um, utilizing that freedom and causing harm, uh, then yeah, it's uh, just like with the mask situation, there could be a place for um, affecting that right. So that, that was the First Amendment. That was deep, guys. We took it there. We took it very deep. Um, and that's the biggest one, <laughs> you know, because then we move on to the Second Amendment, and that's not really, I mean, it's a funny one. 
a well-regulated militia be necessary. Again, this is the Second Amendment. This is the second most important right to us as citizens. <laughs> a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Um, okay, so yeah, that's that makes sense. Um, Amendment 3, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered, uh, quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So yeah, that's your your right to your property, I guess. Your right to, um, but in time of peace. That's interesting. Or, nor in a time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So, you know, if we're in time of war, then that right could be taken away if, if the law decided to. Yeah, I don't really feel like that right is really a right. I think that's it's just like a common decency type of a thing. Uh, yeah. So again, like, even like the freedom of speech, I don't really feel like that's a right. Like, it's, it's like a... Voting, on the other hand, that is that is a right. That is something that's given to us uh, that, that we normally wouldn't have if, um, if we were just autonomous beings wandering around the earth. You know, the right to right to vote is something unique to democracy. That we're given that right. The right to the think what we want and say what we want. You know, I, I just like, I, I, yeah, I don't feel like that's that's a right. Um, I guess the right to bear arms, but there's a lot of conditions with that. It's for the purpose of militia. So we haven't, I've talked about that over and over again on this series. I won't go deeper into it, but definitely a lot of room for uh, reevaluation. Amendment 4, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search, it, searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Yeah. And, you know, as I remember, all the rest of the amendments are really have to do with our rights as criminals. <laughs> Or potential criminals, as we see here. So they can't they can't seize anything or search anything without their um, their warrants. Which you could just create other layers of warrants or laws to you know take those easily take those rights away. Amendment 5, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment from a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be witnessed against himself nor be, be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So again, our rights as criminals. Not to say that we don't need to have these documented. It's very important that these are documented, but I would hardly say that this is a right of the citizen. Like, everyday citizen, law-abiding, civilized citizen, um, you know, it's good to know that uh, if I do something bad and are uh, punished for it, that, that I have some rights in that process. But um, again, not a whole lot of rights written here, you know, just for our everyday living. Amendment 6, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury to the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Again, criminal rights. It's good though. 
Amendment 7. In suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be uh, preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise reexamined re in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. I'm just double checking uh, what this means. Common law, common law suits. Yeah, it's just, yeah. <sighs> in suits of common law where the value in controversy shall ex exceed $20. Well, that's easy now. $20 back in 1776 was probably a lot. I only did $19 crimes at that time. <laughs> I don't know, what if it was less? Again, more criminal rights. Uh, amendment 8. Excessive bail should not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. More rights for when I'm a criminal. When that day comes, I'll know all my rights. Uh, amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. I guess that's that's a nice one, you know. Not, uh, yeah. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Other rights retained by the people. Okay, thank you so much for this nice calming water music while uh, I read all this stuff. The Ninth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution is somewhat of an enigma. It provides that the naming of the certain rights in the Constitution does not take away from the people's rights that are not named. Yet neither the language nor the history of the Ninth Amendment offers any hints as to the nature of the rights it was designed to protect. Every year, federal courts are asked to recognize new and uh, enumerated rights retained by the people, and typically they turn to the Ninth Amendment. However, the federal judiciary does not base rulings exclusively on the Ninth Amendment. The courts usually cite the amendment as a secondary source of fundamental liberties. In particular, the Ninth Amendment has played a significant role in establishing the constitutional right to privacy. There we go. Our right to privacy. Ratified in 1791, the Ninth Amendment is, uh, is an outgrowth of a disagreement between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists over the importance of attaching a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. When the Constitution was initially drafted by the Framers in 1787, it contained no Bill of Rights. That's true. The, the, the Federalists, uh, Hamilton, those guys, they didn't want a Bill of Rights. The Anti-Federalists were the ones that fought, fought to get them in. When the Constitution was initially drafted by um, the Anti-Federalists, who generally opposed ratification because they believed that the Constitution conferred too much power to the federal government, supporting a Bill of Rights to serve as an additional constraint against um, despotism, uh, tyranny. The Federalists, on the other hand, supported ratification of the Constitution without a Bill of Rights because they believed that any enumeration of fundamental liberties was unnecessary and dangerous. Dangerous? Okay. The Federalists contended that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary because, in their view, the federal government possessed only limited powers that were expressly delegated to the Constitution. They believed that all powers not constitutionally delegated to the federal government were inherently reserved to the people and the states. Nowhere in the Constitution, the Federals pointed out, is the federal government given the power to trample on individual liberties. The Federalists feared that if the Constitution were to include a Bill of Rights that protect, protected certain liberties from government encroachment, 
an inference would be drawn that the federal government could exercise an implied power to regulate such liberties. Hamilton, one of the leading federalists, articulated this concern in uh, Federalist Number 84, uh, why should a Bill of Rights, uh, Hamilton asked, declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do. But dangerous? Yeah, I just don't get that. If anybody has any uh, insight on why separating the um, separating the federal government and the three branches of that to the individuals and their rights um, and, and defining those things would be dangerous, I'd, I'd really love to hear uh, your ideas on what the, the founding fathers, on, on what the federalists um, meant by saying it was dangerous. But yeah, Ninth Amendment, um, yeah, it's our right to privacy. It's like, I guess this, this kind of covers up all of the rights that aren't written out in the rest of the Bill of Rights, um, but usually is, is privacy. Because yeah, we don't have, a, there, uh, the right to privacy is not, uh, not written anywhere in the Constitution. But I think that's, everybody agrees that we all have that a right to privacy. Maybe that should be more defined. All right, and then the last in the Bill of Rights, the Tenth Amendment, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So uh, this one just uh, provides that hierarchy of influence, federal, state, individual. Um, yeah, so again, nothing about individual rights. So yeah, that's the Bill of Rights. That's what we're working with. Uh, really, the the only right written in that there is like our right uh, to our thoughts and speaking our thoughts, the First Amendment. Everything else seems to be uh, particular rights, mostly our criminal rights. You know, again, I think it's great that those are written out. Um, but uh, yeah, so interesting. Such an interesting conversation of why the Founding Fathers, the Federalists, would believe it would be dangerous uh, to define the rights that... What did they say? They said that if the Bill of Rights were defined, then the federal government would have something to regulate, would have something, and if they're not defined, that... I feel like it would be the opposite. If things aren't defined, then there is nothing to protect. But if something's defined, then there's something to be held accountable to it. But I don't know. Who knows? People thought differently at that time. Okay, so that's our Bill of Rights. Only one right to Britain. Uh, I found another government document um, that has uh, more rights written out. And so I kind of want to turn to that. And this is where I'm going to get off the track of the Constitution. And now I'm going to talk about uh, citizenship. citizenship. Citizenship rights. That's a hard one. Um, and so, yeah, this is from the website of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, so this is for folks that want to become American citizens. Uh, and this, this website really highlights uh, what rights and responsibilities you have as a citizen. So this is not the Constitution, but this is an official government document uh, that defines what rights a uh, prospective citizen of this country would have. Off-roading? Are you off-roading now? Or is this water making you think of off-roading? I don't, I don't understand how off-roading is uh, relevant here. But I would like to understand, so please enlighten me. <laughs> Citizenship is a common thread that connects all Americans. We are a nation bound not by race or religion, but by the shared values of freedom, liberty, and equality. Throughout our history, the United States has welcomed newcomers from all over the world, immigrants that helped shape and define the country we know today. Their contributions help preserve our legacy as a land of freedom and opportunity. More than 200 years after our founding, naturalized citizens are still an important part of our democracy. By becoming a U.S. citizen, you too will have a voice in how our nation is governed. Our, our right to be a part of the democracy. So there it is. That's the right. That's something you need. That's something that, like, we're born as, like, primal, autonomous human beings. 
we don't have that right. You know, we just have a right to ourselves, and you know, maybe even creating our own democracy for ourselves. But like uh, a right to be a part of a process of how a larger organization um, works is is pretty cool. Oh, I'm going off track. Yeah, off roading. I got my muddy tires on, ready to to go off track. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> The decision to apply is a significant one. Citizen, citizenship offers many benefits and equally important responsibilities. By applying, you are demonstrating your commitment to this country and our form of government. Below, you will find several rights and responsibilities that all citizens have. Um, and so they have referenced the Citizens' Almanac, a promise of freedom, an introduction to U.S. history and civics for immigrants, uh, Declaration of Independence, um, and... Uh, Important information for new citizens. So yeah, actually the uh, the Constitution's not. Oh yeah, here we go. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. So yeah, the, those are what's referenced for uh, this little chart here, which I found useful. So our rights: a freedom to express yourself. So there's a First Amendment. Freedom to worship as you wish. First Amendment. A right to prompt. Fair trial uh, by jury. Um, which amendment was that again? Uh, sixth Amendment. Right to vote in elections for public officials. Um, yep, so that's uh, lower down in the amendments, but that's there in the Constitution. Right to apply for federal employment requiring U.S. citizenship. Okay. Right to run for elective office, so that's also in the Constitution. And then uh, here's the most important one, and this is the one that I want to spend the rest of this time talking on, uh, which is the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can pursue a pursuit. Pursuit, pursuit, pursuit. Uh, that's what I found, which is interesting about uh, this whole thing, is that particular word, pursuit, um, and how... Somehow, in time, that word got injected here. It got injected so much that it's twice freedom to pursue a pursuit. <laughs> okay, how are you gonna how are you gonna get that on your resume? That would be funny. It would be so funny to have a resume like that. That's just like documenting all of your your citizenship rights and citizenship duties. That'd be cool. That'd be a statement. And the employer that's interviewing you would be like, "What? why is this relevant? Why is this on your resume? It's like, yeah, it's the most relevant. That'd be cool if we got to, we got to that time where that would become relevant. Okay, you may be the one. Uh, you may be the, the one to start that trend of bringing uh, civic engagement uh, to the resume, to our value as a potential employee. Uh, okay, so before I go into this whole pursue, pursuit, 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 uh, I, I just want to briefly go over the responsibilities uh, of a U.S. citizen, uh, support and defend the Constitution. So uh, the fact that we're studying it and you're listening you study it right now, you are doing your duty as a citizen. So, gold star sticker for all of us. Stay informed on the issues affecting your community. People forget about that. Uh, participate in the democratic process. Go vote. Vote.org. Vote.org vote .org is the best website to go to uh, to get lined up with this responsibility. You can register, you can update your registration, you can um, sign up for your mail-in ballot if that's what you need, you can find your polling place, you can even sign up to uh, be a poll worker from that one website. And I just put that in the comments. So um, if you're having trouble understanding how uh, you can participate in the democratic process, go to that website. Respect and obey federal, state, and local laws. Uh, respect the rights, beliefs, and opinions of others. Participate in your local community. Pay income and other taxes honestly and on time to federal, state, and local authorities. 
That's a good one. We need you to drink tea and vote. I'll design something. That sounds good. Yeah, drink tea, vote, study the Constitution. It's our responsibility. It's not our right. It's our re Those are responsibilities, actually. That's interesting. So, yeah, Kayla, I, I stand corrected. Voting is not even a right. It's That's a responsibility. Interesting. Well, at least according to the Immigration Office, uh, they believe that voting is a responsibility, not a right. You know what's interesting? For all the other players within our government system, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, um, if, if we were to put their rights and responsibilities on this chart, uh, they wouldn't have any rights. Those folks wouldn't have any rights. They purely have responsibilities. They have rights as citizens, just like we do. As the, so the only, the only ones in this democracy that have rights are citizens. Everybody else has responsibilities or duties and need to be held accountable. And it's written in the Constitution how they're held accountable. So, you know, don't be surprised when people want to impeach and, um, and hold their leaders accountable for their responsibilities. Uh, last two responsibilities, serve on a jury when called upon and uh, to defend the country if the need should arise. Uh, so those are responsibilities. Uh, but again, I, I did want to focus on this last right, uh, which is actually, this is, um, this is the only right of this list of rights that's not documented directly in the Constitution. This is actually documented in our Declaration of Independence, which is related. Those documents are related, uh, but they're different. Uh, and I found that very interesting. So I did a little research on this freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I found this, uh, this article here from Emory University titled, What the Declaration of Independence Really Means by Pursuit of Happiness. Um, this was published a few years ago. And it's very interesting. So it says, uh, more than just fireworks and cookouts, the 4th of July offers an opportunity to reflect on how our founders envisioned our new nation, including the Declaration of Independence, oft quoted, unalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But our contemporary understanding of the pursuit of happiness is a thinner, less meaningful shadow of what the Declaration's author is intended, according to Brett Strawn, who teaches religion and theology in Emory's uh, uh, Cadler School of Theology and Graduate Division of Religion. It may be that the American dream, if that is parsed as lots of money and the like, isn't a sufficient definition of the good life or true happiness. It may, in fact, be detrimental, he says. Um, and this is from the Bible and the pursuit of happiness, what the Old and New Testaments teach us about the good life. Um, and that seems like an interesting title. I would check that book out. I've become recently interested in, in, in biblical stories uh, and what they can represent, so uh, may, I might check this one out. Maybe I'll talk about it with you guys later. Uh, so he discusses the pursuit of happiness is commonly thought to be mean today what our founders meant um, and how a thick understanding of happiness can be better guide for both individuals and nations. Now, what does happiness mean? Uh, in the Declaration of Independence guarantees uh, the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But what does that phrase mean, pursuit of happiness, uh, when you hear it today? I think most people think pursuits in the phrase means chasing happiness as in the phrase, in hot pursuit. Uh, that, that would mean that the pursuit of happiness has to do with somehow seeking it or going after it. And how does this differ from when the nation's uh, founders met uh, when they wrote that in the Declaration of Independence? Uh, it differs a lot. I love, you know, this is like, a, this is like an academic, academic paper and they, 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 they use an exclamation point in this statement. It differs a lot. I like it. Uh, Arthur Sch uh, Schlesinger should be credited, and I, I pulled him up too, we'll talk about him. He's credited for pointing out in a, a, an essay he wrote in 1964 that at the time of the Declaration's composition, the pursuit of happiness did not mean chasing or seeking, but actually practicing happiness, the experience of happiness, not just chasing it, but actually catching it. 
you might say. That like we have a right for the happiness just to be there and that we can just live it and experience it. That pursuit of happiness does not mean that we have to live. Yeah, it's our right, American dream. We can make our own happiness. We can chase our own happiness. Uh, but what the founding fathers originally intended was that uh, the job of the government uh, was to make sure that the happiness was just there for us to, to live and enjoy. Uh, this is demonstrated by documents that are contemporary with the Declaration, but by the Declaration itself and the continuation of the same sentence that contains the pursuit of happiness phrase, the continuation speaks of affecting people's safety and happiness, but the clearest explanation might be the Virginia Convention's Declaration of Rights, which dates June 12, 1776, just a few weeks before July 4th. The Virginia Declaration actually speaks of pursuing and obtaining of happiness. So there, that's a difference that, you know, perhaps if the Declaration had included this word obtaining instead of just pursuing, just pursuit. Um, so it would be like life, liberty, and pursuit and um, procurement of happiness. <laughs> and why does this difference matter? Uh, seeking happiness is one thing, but actually obtaining it and experiencing it, practicing happiness is an entirely different matter. Again, another exclamation point in the middle of the sentence. I love it. It's the difference between dreaming and reality. Remember that the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration is not a quest or a pastime, but an unalienable right. Everyone has the right to actually be happy, not just to try to be happy. Uh, to use a metaphor, you don't just get the chance to make the baseball team. Uh, you are guaranteed a spot. That's a very different understanding. Unalienable rights in the role of government. So the next part of the sentence in the Declaration of Independence states, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. What does that mean? And as, a, as you have written, that the Declaration makes that obtaining and practicing of happiness a matter of government and public policy, not one of individual leisure or pleasure. I think it means, at least in part, that the happiness of which the Declaration speaks is not simple, light, and momentary uh, pleasure and happy, uh, a la some hedonistic understanding of happiness. Uh, do what feels right if it makes you happy. In the Declaration, the pursuit of happiness is listed with the other unalienable rights of life and liberty. Those are qualities of existence, states of being. You are either alive or dead, free or enslaved, happy or unhappy. Incredible. I've never thought about it from this perspective. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying this a lot. Governments have something to say about those states uh, by how they govern their citizens. If happiness is akin to life and liberty, as the Declaration and the original meaning of the pursuit of happiness say, then we are not dealing with momentary pleasurable sensations, such as, I'm happy the sun came out this afternoon, but with deep and extended qualities of life, uh, such as the happiness one feels to be cancer-free, for instance. According to the Declaration, the extended quality of happiness, what we might call the good or flourishing life, is or should be a primary concern of government. That means it isn't just about my happiness, especially idiosyncratically defined, but about all citizens' happiness. If the Founders' understanding of the pursuit of happiness does indeed, indeed have profound public policy ramifications and thus real connections to social justice, what are some specific examples of actions the government does or should take to secure that right today? If we operate with a thick definition of happiness, then we have to think beyond simplistic understandings of happiness, as important as those are, and think about the good life more broadly. It may be that the American dream, if it is parsed as lots of money and the like, isn't a sufficient definition of the good life or true happiness, it may in fact be detrimental. Empirical research and happiness has shown that more money does not in fact make a significant difference in someone's happiness. The ultra rich are not any happier than the ultra middle class person and sometimes to the contrary. So moving beyond just the hedonistic aspects of happiness, researchers have demonstrated that the importance of positive emotions, positive individual traits, i.e 
for example, virtues and positive institutions. Government should, could, and should, according to the uh, declaration, and enable such things. To lift up just two examples that I think a lot about myself, the government needs to take action to guarantee all citizens' health and safety. A fifth definition of happiness certainly includes many things, and sick people can, in fact, be very happy, can live flourishing lives, but, oh, excuse me. Sorry, guys, my camera went out. I'll, I'll get it back up in a second. Governments could and should, according to the declaration, enable such things. Uh, a thick definition of happiness certainly includes many things, and sick people can, in fact, be very happy with um, can live flourishing lives. But positive institutions that keep us healthy and safe are, to my mind, specific and concrete ways the government can help a country's gross national happiness index. Um, and that's a homage to Bhutan. So yeah, mandating masks is something the government can do to uh, ensure a broad spectrum of happiness in life, in life, you know. But happiness would mean being healthy, you know, at mass as a community, not as individuals. Food, medicine, safe living conditions, those are a few important building blocks of the happy life that governments can't address. Uh, so this question is about the Bible. Your book focuses on what the Bible teaches us about the pursuit of happiness, and you also note the current role of positive psych psychology as our society's primary arena for asking what happiness means. What is the most important lesson we can learn from both of these sources to help us understand and pursue happiness now? Just this, and that both the Bible and positive psychology give us a very thick understanding of what the word happiness means. It's not about breakfast being yummy, it's about human flourish, flourishing, the good life. The obtaining and experiencing of all that can be glossed with the word happiness. But only carefully, and usually with a few sentences of explanation required to flesh it all out. A thick understanding of happiness means that we have to think beyond only pleasurable sensations and think about redefining happiness altogether. If pleasure is only uh, is the only thing it means, if that's the only thing happiness means anymore, uh, then we have a case of word pollution, and we need to reclaim or redefine the word, or perhaps use a different one altogether, at least for a while. So we're canceling the word happiness now. Okay. Redefining simplistic, thin definitions of happiness means that we come to terms that the happy life does not mean a life devoid of real problems and real pain. Those two are part of life and can even contribute to human growth and flourishing, which means they can and must be incorporated into a thick notion of happiness. As one positive psychologist has said, the only people who don't feel normal negative feelings are the pathologically psychotic or the dead. Or according to the biblical uh, book of Psalms, the only people who live lives of constant comfort and pleasure are the wicked. Interesting. So positive psychology speaks of post-traumatic growth, a kind of growth only experienced and only able to be experienced after grief. Or to think about the New Testament, when Christians call the day Jesus was crucified Good Friday, they certainly do not mean by that that it was a fun-filled day. Faith, you like this, huh? This is good, you know, it's good. You know, usually I don't get to integrate religion into the Constitution Study Group because, you know, those things were supposed to be uh, separated. But uh, this is interesting. <laughs> Instead, uh, that is a very thick use of the word good, and that it's kind of a thick use that we must have when we speak of happiness, one that can encompass sorrow, that includes social concerns like food, health, and safety, and that is about experiencing the good, flourishing life, not just hoping for it. But yeah, canceled. I, I use the term canceled because the whole cancel culture thing uh, that... Uh, that has been a common theme throughout a lot of my sessions over the past few weeks. That, uh, you know, this article is saying that the way that we're using the term happiness 
is irresponsible and damaging. So we need to stop using it and or use it in a way that will, you know, redefine it. So that's that's all that meant by cancel culture on that. Let's see. Okay, let me get me back. We find it interesting. I find it interesting too. You know that uh, maybe our solutions are that uh, we don't we don't need to um, we just need to redefine things. You know, a constant theme that that's been coming up for me of like what what is like one thing that we could focus on doing that could solve a lot of the problems that we've been talking about in regards to inequalities and wealth and inequalities in rights and inequalities in privilege is one thing I think that we could do is normalize poverty. And I think that term normalizing poverty is related to what this article is saying here. That um, the, the example of Good Friday, that when Christians call it Good Friday, they're not calling it Good Friday because it was a great day and everybody was having parades and partying in the streets, but because um, something good came in a place of suffering. But, you know, definitely that was like totally a day of suffering, um, yet, you know, still called a Good Friday because yet even the rich can be sad and even the poor can be happy. And that's more important. And, and actually, a, a common theme you hear over and over again is that the poor are happier. Right? And it seems like that shouldn't work. You know, our definition of happiness is the acquisition of property. Like, they don't have any property. Like, how could they be happy? Um, and that's because they are so poor that, like, all they've got is their happiness. You know, happiness is an inalienable thing that just should be there that we should just be able to experience. Um, it's not something that we have to work on. Oh, I have to pursue this happiness in order to feel it. It's like, no, you should just be able to feel it. Even if you're sick, even if you're poor, even if you're hungry, you should be able to feel it. And the government's job is to do whatever it can to protect your ability to feel it. Joy and content, yes. So if uh, poor people can just live within joy and content, magical things could happen. Instead, contentment is different than happiness. Let's look that up. Our viewer is making a claim that contentment is different than happiness. And let's see what the internet has to say about that. Happiness is generally defined as the experience of frequent positive thoughts, such as joy, interest, or pride. Contentment is generally defined as a longer lasting, but a deeper feeling of satisfaction and gratitude. There we go. And that came from a Medium article written by Lee Serpa Azevado, Azevado? written last year on April 1st of all days. So April Fool's, he wrote that. But yeah, no, those are different words, but at the same time, uh, maybe that's a solution. I think that's a great idea. Like, instead of using the word happiness, like our job, you know, as Americans is, is a pursuit of uh, replacing the word happiness with contentment, the pursuit of contentment. The pursuit of just being and knowing that your happiness is there. Knowing that sustained experience, feeling of happiness is always there. That's powerful. That's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you for that. And actually, I have been using that word contentment um, as like a powerful word. It's like... <sighs> Just being civilized and content. We could be so powerful as the entire humanity, uh, not even just as uh, an American government. 
uh, or democracy, but as a humanity, if, if we could all just focus on, on that, oh man, so much good come from, could, could come from that. And there wouldn't be a stigma around poverty. So in order for us to create a safe place for that to happen, we have to first normalize poverty. Normalize everything. Normalize pain. Normalize illness. Normalize those things. So then we can evolve and grow from them uh, and find that contentment. So yes, a very, very good observation. Pursuing happiness in today's world. Does the current political climate in the United States impact the need for a thick understanding of the pursuit of happiness? Since this article first appeared, I admit that I am even more struck now in 2018 by the need for the government to help people attain, pursue, and actually reach key elements of human flourishing, food safety, medicine, and the like. Politically, of course, people will differ in these issues and how they are best achieved, but it's clear that in recent years in this country, we have had vicious political debates over things that are at root profoundly connected to these elements of happiness and who will gain access to them. Take, for example, the debate over universal health care or debates over gun violence and gun control or immigration. Each is complement, uh, complicated and multifaceted. People who are stricter immigration laws are likely concerned about their own safety and well-being. This is fully understandable. And yet, if happiness is a universal right, which is what the Declaration of Independence states, then that means we must consider the safety and well-being of others too, including the safety and well-being of immigrants and refugees who would otherwise be turned away at our borders. In this regard, the political story of Ruth the... I'm sorry, guys. I gotta go. Bitcoin play crazy at the door. I'll be right back. Regard the biblical story of Ruth the Moabites, Moabitess. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, it's rather remarkable. Had she been turned away at the border, then Israel would have never had its greatest king, David, since he was her great grandson. Or to continue the lineage a bit further, without Ruth. There is not only no David, there is also no Jesus, since according to the New Testament, he is a direct descendant from Ruth, the Moabite refugee. Or to switch topics, one might like to stockpile weapons in order to feel safe, but one must also ask, must, must ask about the effects of gun culture, the proliferation of guns, and if all that is, in fact, a truly safer way of life for the flourishing of all people. Statistics from other modern industrialized countries in the world that do not have the same gun obsession as Americans suggest, in fact, that it is not necessarily a safer way, or at least such data indicates that the proliferation of weaponry is certainly not the only way to think about safety and well-being. So now in 2018, I continue to think that the thickest and best definition of the pursuit of happiness means we must think about facilitating the achievement of others' happiness and not be inordinately or exclusively self-obsessed with our own happiness. There you have it. So, like, I think faith, it may be like a combination of contentment and compassion. Those things together would be happiness in, in this, like, a thick definition of happiness, as this writer says. 
Such a regard for others and their happiness would have certainly resonated with the early founding fathers uh, of our country, many of whom were themselves immigrants and who were concerned not simply with their own well-being, but with all those who would come after them in the United States. The happiness of other future generations was ensured, as it were, in the Declaration in its claim regarding the unalienable rights. Concern for other people's happiness is also unquestionably true for the Bible, where among other examples, one might cite Jesus' instruction to his disciples, no one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. I have to admit, however, that I am less sanguine now in uh, 2018 about the government's interest in and ability to produce widespread happiness of the thickest variety for all people. The vast majority of what comes across the news scrawl these days, scrawl these days, seem remarkably, um, what is this word? I always learn new words. My vocabulary is not that great. I just know the T words. <laughs> just the T words. Uh, related to a church parish. Okay. How do you say it? Parochial. Parochial. Oh, I've heard that word before. Parochial. Uh, if not downright tribalistic. And tribalistic... That's another cool word. A tribe is uh, a group of people with a common en enemy. Advocating or practicing strong loyalty to one's own tribe or social group. A nationalism. But a tribe is a group of people with a common enemy. I learned that a few weeks ago. The happiness that is being sought is typically up for sale to the highest bidder with the most power, including firepower. Such a vision of happiness is truly thin and can never lay appropriate claim to the Declaration's grand vision of flourishing. But the Declaration's grand vision is still there. And that gives me hope that good peoples throughout the world and throughout society and government may yet seek the greatest good for all humanity. May it be so! And he ends it with another exclamation point. Good. I liked this. This was good. This was good. Learned a lot. Uh, I also looked up this dude and his article written in 1964. So people have been talking about this for a while. It's not just uh, a new thing. But this guy, Arthur Sch Schlesinger? Schlesinger? And he wrote this article, The Lost Meeting in the Pursuit of Happiness. Probably no historical expression is more familiar to Americans than the pursuit of happiness. Immortalized by the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, yet it has puzzled many that life and liberty should be pronounced by the great document as unaidable rights in all men, but not happiness, only the pursuit of it. It is worth asking, however, what Jefferson and his associates on the drafting committee really meant by the famous phrase. Able scholars have repeated, examined the meaning, repeatedly examined the meaning of the text as a whole, but none have given attention to this particular wording. What then was the import of the term pursuit in the minds of the framers of the Declaration? Did it signify merely the pursuing or seeking of happiness, as is conventionally assumed? Or was it used in a different sense, as when we today refer to the pursuit of law or the pursuit of medicine? According to the New English Dictionary, is born both meetings since at least the 16th century. Obviously, the distinction is a vital one, for if the common uh, supposition is mistaken, it follows that the historic manifesto proclaimed the practicing rather than the quest of happiness as a basic right, equality of life and liberty. He goes on. Uh, the, it's only a couple more pages, but I, I won't read that. Uh, what I just read is the, the bulk of it. So this guy was the first one to call that out. And, and really say, hey, 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 the words here, pursuit of happiness, are much different than, than we've all been thinking. Uh, and I think that's pretty powerful. And Kayla, yeah, you asked me to go over our rights. And I know this is not directly related to it, but um, I guess to summarize, you know, what's been learned in this process is I always thought that the right to vote was our only thought 
always, uh, since I've been doing this constitution study group, uh, I always felt like that was the only right we really had uh, in participating in the democratic process. Um, but now coming to learn that that's actually a responsibility, just like it's the responsibility of the president to commission um, you know, the offices that he uh, needs to commission. And that uh, if that person who's commissioned in those uh, positions fucks up, it falls back on the president. Because it was his responsibility to choose the best person possible for that position. So, the same thing on us. <laughs> the same thing on us as citizens. That, like, uh, it's our responsibility to vote who best represents us in making the laws of protecting our rights. And our rights are the freedom to, to say and think and practice what we want to practice. Um, and what's not written in the Constitution, I just went into great detail about, is in regards to this pursuit of happiness that, um, yeah, the pursuit of happiness does not mean it's our rights for the American dream. It's like our right to just be able to experience happiness. The government needs to do what it can to protect that right for public health, public safety, all those things. Um, so let's take it even deeper and maybe in following weeks uh, I can revisit this this question. If it is the government's right to, uh, not right, the government's responsibility to protect our rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and if uh, the current consumerism model, the current corporate consumerism model uh, that has become the major theme of the way our society works since the Industrial Revolution began almost 200 years ago, if that ideology is um, harming our ability to experience happiness, if it's detrimental, as this article I read said, would it be the government's responsibility to stomp out consumerism? To stomp out the culture that our happiness is related to uh, some type of acquisition of, 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 of wealth? Uh, I don't know. But uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to research that more and I'm going to talk more about that because that's powerful. You know, that's powerful. That's so powerful. And if I ever got into a position of leadership in government, I would take that responsibility very seriously. Um, I definitely would outlaw certain things that have been proven to be, um, I don't know why I'm, I'm always out of Zoom here. Here we go. Is that better? No, it doesn't, it doesn't help. I don't know, for some reason it goes out of Zoom sometimes. Um, yeah, if I was to get into a position of leadership, I'd outlaw high fructose corn syrup. I'd outlaw um, unethical marketing, including misinformation in marketing. That's a big thing I am really, really pissed off about. You know, that like general public, for the most part, in this consumerism culture that we're in, not only uh, do we define happiness with acquisition of property and wealth, uh, but we uh, have allowed ourselves to become educated by the marketers, uh, by the, the folks that are the backbone of that culture. And uh, there are no fact-checking organizations for information distributed in marketing. There are uh, no uh, fact-checking. So there's, there's journalistic fact-checking. There's... Uh, um, fact checking in like uh, academic. I mean, the 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 third third. Um, what do you call that? Peer reviewed. You know, whole thing around academic. Really hard to distribute misinformation in academic papers, um, and as well as in, in in politics. So there's fact checking in politics. There's fact checking in journalism, which we need. Yes. But freaking, we need even more fact-checking in marketing. 
And uh, in our consumerism world, yeah, people... Um, Oh, good for you, Kayla. Yeah, Kayla is registered to vote in her new state, um, and she's signing up to work the polls. Thank you for doing your uh, civic duty, your civic responsibility. You're going above and beyond. I'm so proud of you, Kayla. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, fact-checking marketing. That'd be so powerful. Hi, Marco. It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be tuning out now, but since you're here and you missed the, uh, the, the meat and potatoes of this session today, uh, what I've learned today is that uh, voting is not a right, it's a responsibility. Uh, we do have uh, some enable rights, uh, right to think what we want, practice what we want, uh, and, and speak what we want, uh, and that the, uh, the government's responsibility is to protect our rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And that pursuit of happiness is very important uh, to understand that at the time of drafting the Declaration of Independence, uh, pursuit of happiness did not mean our right to chase happiness, to go get happiness. It's our right to experience happiness. And so the government's responsibility is to do what it can to protect the state of happiness and uh, that our definition of happiness has become so co-opted and so corrupted that um, perhaps we need to redefine happiness and do the work to re redefine happiness uh, in the culture. Uh, that happiness is not associated with wealth or acquisition of property. Uh, that happiness is uh, could be better described as the word contentment. So uh, lots to uh, lots to chew on there, uh, but uh, yeah. I'm sure you're registered to vote and ready to practice that uh, civic responsibility. Um, because yeah, that's your responsibility, is to make sure that the right people are in office, that are making the right decisions and laws that are better protecting your right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Much love, Marco. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think I'm gonna tune out now. Um, Oh, yay, friends getting made. Uh, yeah, please, Kayla. Kayla is moving to Arizona, and she just made a friend. Good. I love when that happens. Yeah, you guys should definitely connect. Kayla is good, good people. She's great people. I know her from here in Vegas. Um, right on the bell. <laughs> All right, well, everybody, I love you very much. Thank you so much for letting me, um, you know, hold this space and for being a part of it. Um, yeah, Kayla and uh, Lanai, I'm going to let you guys connect. That is beautiful. I love that that just happened. Um, and yeah, let's pursue happiness. Be happy. Be content. Uh, so happiness now means contentment and compassion together. You know, we'll make it happy. Other people's happiness is more important to our own individual happiness. Let's love you guys. <laughs>